Okay, in this video we're going to take a look at Nancy Tuana's text, Coming to Understand. In this text, Tuana is arguing that we cannot account for what we know without also accounting for what we don't know and who is privileged and who is disadvantaged by the production of knowledge ignorance. So, Tuana is not only giving us a philosophical argument about knowledge, she's giving us a, a kind of sociological account of the history of knowledge about female genitalia here. And Tuana argues that appeals to reality are not enough to explain why we accept particular beliefs as true and thus as knowledge, since appeals to true belief are tied up with, enmeshed in social, various social factors that determine what is produced as knowledge and what is produced as ignorance. So understanding what we know also requires understanding what we don't know in the sense of what we have, what we unlearn. That is an epistemological account of what we know about female genitalia and sexuality requires us to look at what we don't know, that is, to give an epistemology of ignorance about female genitalia, because epistemologies of ignorance are necessary to theories of knowledge. And what we mean by ignorance is not merely a lack of knowledge, things that we don't know. Like knowledge, ignorance is an active production. It involves complex social practices that determine what is known and what kind of knowledge is actively resisted. So ignorance like knowledge is actively produced. And cognitive authority, trust, doubt, silencing, oppression are all involved in the production of ignorance. So the politics of ignorance has to be a key element of any social and political and epistemological account. It can reveal the role of power in knowledge construction and the production of ignorance, as well as the values at play in the production of knowledge ignorance. So given the fact that Tuwana is arguing that we have to look not only at the production of knowledge, but also at the production of ignorance, because knowledge ignorance production is enmeshed in social factors, she then suggests that if we do a sociology of knowledge about female sexuality, we can gain some insight on knowledge ignorance production itself. So female sexuality, female genitalia, is a kind of domain of knowledge ignorance production that can help us to understand the social factors, the values, the social power at play, in the production of knowledge and ignorance about sexuality in female genitalia. So, bodies and their pleasures are not natural givens. We've heard this claim before. McKinnon makes this claim in response to the kind of Freudian accounts that take sexuality to be some kind of natural drive. And so, for Tuana as well, there is no true female sexuality that's hidden beneath social oppressions. There is no, uh, it's not the case that there is a kind of natural sexual drive or sexual pleasure that lies beneath layers of social practices and structures that have, that have been mapped on top of it. So there's no true female sexuality hidden beneath social oppressions. So attending to women's bodies and desires can help us to understand and to reveal the construction of desire and how that has played a role in knowledge, the knowledge ignorance production about women's sexuality and women's genitalia. Moreover, attending to bodies and desires and the production of knowledge ignorance about women's sexuality and genitalia can spark a kind of resistance to the normalization and control of women's bodies that tends to be r rampant in our society. We've talked a little bit about this in terms of normalization of sexed bodies with Fausto Starling's account of the medicalization of intersex infants, 
Uh, we've talked about this in terms of disabled bodies with Garland Thompson and Alexa Shrimp. I've made mention of things like weight and beauty standards and other ways that bodies are policed and normalized in our society. And so one of the things that Tuana is trying to do here indirectly is to spark a kind of resistance to that normalization, particularly in terms of female sexuality and desire. So her goal here then is to, is to trace what we do and do not know about women's orgasms and genitalia to, and to trace why we do and don't know particular things about women's sexuality, orgasms, and women's genitalia. And according to Tawana, we know much more about male genitalia than we do about female genitalia. Having regularly taught classes on anatomy, Tawana testifies to the fact that many women, including students, know little about their clitoris, including how big their clitoris is, how much variation there is among female genitalia, about the complexities of the clitoris, yet male students know these things about their penises. In fact, both men and women know more about the structures of the penis than, the, than they do about the structures of the clitoris. And one of the primary reasons for this, according to Tuana, is that most knowledge about female genitalia focuses on reproductive aspects of female genitalia. So recent histories of sexuality give little to no attention to the clitoris while giving a great amount of attention to the penis because the penis is central to reproduction. In the late 20th century, though, the women's health movement did start to question what was understood as scientific knowledge about the clitoris and to make knowledge about the clitoris visible in all of its complexity and detail. However, despite several years of disseminating knowledge about female genital structures, little has changed in terms of what people know about female genitalia, despite a pretty good knowledge of male genitalia. Tawana chalks this up to a politics of ignorance. There's a politics of ignorance at work here in the history of female sexuality, which is linked directly to the politics of sex and to the politics of reproduction. So what she's saying here is that what we know about female genitalia, about female orgasms, about the clitoris, comes to us through a framework or filter of a politics of reproduction and a politics of sex. So the knowledge that we have and the ignorance that we have has been produced historically through this kind of uh, uh, lens or framework of the importance of reproduction and the importance of a binary sex system. So for this reason, the importance of male pleasure and ejaculation has never been, has never been questioned because male ejaculation through the framework of reproduction is seen as central and important, something we need to know about. Yet for women, pleasure is a point of controversy. So male pleasure is central to reproduction. Female pleasure is not central to reproduction. And so the main purpose of sex has been seen to be reproduction. And since the clitoris was seen to have no role in reproduction, it was seen as irrelevant. And so Rather than knowledge production, we see ignorance production concerning female genitalia and female orgasm. In fact, because of the politics of reproduction, homosexuals were studied for biological markers of sexual deficiency. Because from a framework of reproduction, women who were not in heterosexual relationships were seen as deviant. For that reason, their genitals became the focus of scientific gaze. In fact, in the early 20th century in New York, there was a study in which inverts, homosexuals, and deviants, along with non-whites, were studied to prevent them from procreating. So the deviance was mapped onto women's bodies, of course, and these scientific authorities argued that the genitals of these non-white, non-heterosexual 
women were different from normal bodies. Uh, so women who had erect clitorises, large labia, smaller uteruses, etc., were labeled as being sexually deviant. So what we know about women's genitals shows that epistemology is not merely about truth that maps onto the, onto the world, but it's about social power. And so looking at the sociological history of knowledge ignorance about the clitoris is an embodied discourse a history of bodies and pleasures. And if we look, continue looking at the history of bodies and pleasures, we'll see that there's a pleasure gap in heterosexual sex. Most men report orgasming during their first sexual experience with a woman, while few women report orgasming in their first sexual experience with a man. And as Tawana notes, this is interesting given women's ability for, for multiple orgasm. So we have to question here how and why it is that heterosexuality as an institution normalizes the focus on male pleasure. And again, recall that for Tawana, sexuality is seen through a politics of reproduction. And we could set Tawana's account side by side with McKinnon's and see some of the, the parallels in their accounts, though they're making distinct arguments. But like McKinnon, Tawana is arguing that repressed female sexuality, the repression of female desire, increases male desire. So there's a focus in terms of what sexuality is and what it means and how bodies practice sexuality. There's a focus on male desire, but there's a kind of ignorance about female desire and female orgasm. In fact, the clitoral orgasm, due to this politics of reproduction, as seen as a kind of less mature orgasm than vaginal orgasm. Although most women experience clitor clitoral orgasm more than vaginal orgasm. So, so the politics of reproduction is so central to sexuality that it becomes a defining element of female genitalia. Knowledge ignorance production about the clitoris is maintained by a commitment to reproduction as the end goal of heterosexual sex. And again, looking back to McKinnon, Heterosexual sex is the model of sexuality that our society is structured on. And this is, a, and this is a, a, an epistemological concern because what we attend to and what we ignore are shaped by the values and politics of our social structures and institutions. So if we discover knowledge about something that others don't take seriously, we shouldn't expect our knowledge to have much effect because social structures are resilient in our society. And you can think back to Butler's account of performative acts. A performative act is not something that we sort of just decide to do in a vacuum, that we are some kind of um, autonomous and self-defined agents who just decide what our sexuality is going to be like. The ways in which we perform our gender, our sex, our sexuality are always shaped by the social. But, again, Butler does allow for some agency on our part in stylizing performative acts in a particular way to kind of subvert social norms, to perform what she calls gender trouble. And Tuana is making a similar claim here when she says that if we can see pleasures as distinct from normalization and discipline, then we can come to understand, literally. And I just love the quote that she cites from Annie Sprinkler, the performer, who says, Some people discover Jesus and want to spread the word. I discovered orgasms and want to spread the word. As Tawana says, we talk about violence against women, we talk about rape, but we don't ever talk about pleasure. Why aren't we producing knowledge about women's pleasure? This knowledge is important because pleasure is a way to live our bodies, to think from our bodies, and to subvert the normalization of our bodies that limit our freedoms. Knowledges and pleasures are related in very complex and important ways. And so what Tuana is arguing here is that by asking whose pleasures are enhanced by ignorance 
and who's are suppressed by knowledge, we can track the importance of social power and values and politics in the production of knowledge ignorance.